an estimated 600 books set in its universe, Warhammer 40k has an absolute metric ton of different characters. Some of them are noble heroes, willing to put themselves in harm's way for the good of mankind, while others are despicable monsters, motivated by power first and foremost. And although many of these characters are beloved by the fanbase, uh, many more are absolutely despised, from everything being Erebus's fault, Marnie's Kalgar's 10-inch thick plot armor, or like 99% of the Horus Heresy Space Wolves. Except for Bjorn. Bjorn's cool. One character who gets kicked around a lot in Warhammer hate circles is Lucius the Eternal, a man whose self-inflated ego and rampant narcissism have led him down an incredibly disturbing path over the last 10,000 years. Now, it's pretty obvious why a lot of people hate this guy. He's done a lot of maniacal evil stuff, and his ability to endlessly resurrect has made him into something of a walking meme. Yet, judging how the villains of most franchises are quite often more iconic and more popular than their heroic adversaries, why doesn't this reign true for a character like Lucius? And is it possible that we're all somehow missing something truly awesome about this guy? And, oh boy, trying to make a video defending one of 40k's most hated characters is something that may have been a better idea on paper. But here we are. Now, needless to say, this video is going to contain a lot of my own thoughts and opinions, so I encourage you to come to your own conclusions. And if by the end of the video you still hate this guy, I, I mean, I get it. Now, before we dive into very well what may be the death of my YouTube career, a quick shout out to this week's sponsor. And then we're going to dive headfirst into the grimdark. Stay tuned. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends has taken over, and gaming will never be the same again. Raid is the first game to bring a true console-level experience to your phone. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. With hundreds of artifacts to equip on over 600 champions, you can build your team and raid your way. My favorite part about Raid has got to be just how many different factions there are. There are so many different choices at your fingertips that every single player can build a truly unique team. It's really difficult to narrow it down, but if I had to pick my top three favorites, it would be the Lizardmen, the Skinwalkers, and the Undead. Because if you know me, dinosaurs, werewolves, and zombies is pretty much what I'm all about. And this month is going to be huge for Raid, as they just released a brand new faction, the Sylvan Watchers, with some amazing new champions, including Forest Elves, Ents, Druids, and Fays. And if that's not enough, Raid's got a full lineup of events along with a new season of the Forge Pass, where you can get your hands on some of the most powerful gear the game has ever seen. Oh yeah, by the way, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. If you haven't started playing Raid yet, then click on the link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen. You'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Rector Draft, 200k silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard. So you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get into the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you right here. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and with that out of the way, let's get into the grimdark. It should come as no surprise that Warhammer 40k is full of absolutely sadistic monsters, from tyrants that enslave entire worlds, to chaos worshippers willing to burn everything that ever was for a taste of power. Out of all the degenerate lowlifes that hide in the shadows of every planet, none are perhaps as deranged as Lucius the Eternal. A once proud space marine of the Emperor's children, famed for his savant-like talents with a blade, he would inevitably become the cursed champion of Slaanesh, fated to seek out ever more dangerous opponents in the never-ending pursuit of perfection. As the years tick by, he spirals deeper and deeper into an all-consuming pit of madness, of which he can never escape. For even if he manages to get himself killed, he will inevitably resurrect each and every time. He is a pitiless and sadistic killer, one who knows nothing of mercy and has stalked the galaxy for over 10,000 years, leaving a trail of mutilated bodies in his wake. He owes his incredible longevity to a demonic suit of armor known as the Armor of Shrieking Souls. The suit gives him the ability to reincarnate by transferring his soul into the body of anyone who manages to kill him. Now, over time, his essence will gestate inside them, forcing them to undergo a twisted metamorphosis. It starts small at first. The infected will begin to hear Lucius's whisperings in the back of their mind, taunting and prodding them. 
Then their hair will begin to fall out, and deep gashes will begin to materialize across the surface of their face, a stigmata that mirrors the iconic lacerations Lucius carved into his own skin. Eventually, he will burst forth from the condemned, completely reformed, and the host's soul will be added to the shrieking faces across his armor. He's basically a blasphemous parasite. In addition to his armor, he wields two hellish melee weapons, the Lash of Torment and the Blade of the Lair. The Lash will often either take the form of a whip or a series of spindly, grotesque tendrils that writhe and undulate with a mind of their own. The Lash is like an amplifier for pain and suffering, and once it wraps around a victim, it will begin to strangle and lacerate them with its hooks, while simultaneously projecting maddening visions and sensations into their mind. Once the helpless victim reaches the peak of human suffering, the Lash will then project this feeling out to every living creature in the immediate area. The followers of Slanesh find this suffering to be exhilarating. Well, their enemies tend to buckle and cower in their presence, many opting to flee for their life, the slightest glimpse into their comrades' immense agony being enough to break their formations. The sword he wields, on the other hand, may seem like just an ordinary power sword, albeit one of an ancient alien design but its historical significance cannot be understated. This is the Blade of the Lair, the same sword that his Primarch Fulgrim retrieved from the Lair Temple and would subsequently come to possess him. The demon that was inside of the sword would eventually be exorcised, and that same greater demon would present the empty sword to Lucius as a mark of favor from the Dark Prince. Since it no longer has the soul of a greater demon bound to it, its power has been substantially diminished, but it still remains an elegant and deadly power sword and in the skilled hands of one of the galaxy's greatest duelists, is still rightfully feared. On top of his equipment, Lucius has been given the Mark of Slanesh, which imbues him with a portion of the Dark God's powers. Now, this is an incredible boon in combat, especially when combined with all of the Slaneshi combat drugs and stems that he takes to heighten his senses in battle even further. So right off the bat, Lucius has all of the properties that make a pretty good villain complete with some ridiculous powers and a Skeletor level of narcissism. To borrow a term from wrestling, everybody loves a good heel. And because of this, villains in a franchise often become more popular than the protagonists that they fight against. That being said, villains aren't for everybody. Some people really just like the heroes. And for these people, it's very obvious why they wouldn't like Lucius. He's a bad guy and a cartoonishly evil one at that. However, even amongst the people who do enjoy good villains, Lucius doesn't seem to be very popular, even though he shares a lot of qualities with some of the greatest villains ever written. For people who enjoy villains, it's not that they necessarily like the Joker or Darth Vader, for example. It's that the audience finds them fascinating and deeply entertaining. So why isn't this the same with Lucius? I think there's a lot of reasons for this, so we're gonna dive into each and every one of them. Uh, first and foremost, the main point his detractors tend to bring up when making a shitpost about him is that he's an asshole, and thus they don't like him. And honestly, that's valid, but it's also kind of the entire point of the character not to like him. He's a vain, smug jerk that thinks he's better than everybody else around him. And what makes it even worse is that he can back up his narcissism with his innate talent, making him all the more frustrating. I don't necessarily think this is a problem for a villain to have a shitty personality. I can think of a lot of villains from different franchises that I enjoy, where the villain doesn't really have anything redeeming about them at all. The first one that comes to mind for me is honestly Frieza from Dragon Ball. He's an overpowered intergalactic space racist, and other than a few team-ups here and there, has never really had a redemption arc, but he's still endlessly entertaining. The second most common problem that people tend to have with Lucius is a combination factor of his self-described title of the greatest duelist to have ever lived, but also have the power to endlessly resurrect, a power that can only happen if he ends up getting beaten. The handful of times that we've seen Lucius getting killed end up overshadowing the 99.9% .9 of battles that he has won. This is a literary problem that many people often refer to as Wolverine Syndrome, wherein you have a character like X-Men's The Wolverine, where their abilities grant them some form of immortality or the ability to regenerate from any injury. For the author, the only way to demonstrate this is to show them constantly getting injured or killed, whereas another character within the same story may have a completely different set of superpowers, but with them, they only have one life to live. And since both of these characters are cloaked in a metric ton of plot armor, we're only ever going to see one of them get killed or mutilated repeatedly, even if that individual on paper is supposed to be much stronger. Now, even confined to Warhammer 40K, this is a problem that is not unique to Lucius, as any of the characters who are gifted with endless resurrection tend to experience the same fate as a writer's 
plot device, which is used to elevate another character as they can be killed without consequence. Saint Celestine, Greater Demons, just about every Necron character, and even the goddamn Swarm Lord can end up becoming victims to this. Lucius's immortality has become his defining feature through memes, but I would argue that despite being an integral part of his character, it's only a single facet of what makes him interesting. The other facets being one, his need to constantly seek out an opponent that can actually present him a challenge, and the other is that he still holds on to one of the original tenets of the Emperor's children and teachings of Fulgrim, that the path to perfection is full of failures, and one cannot achieve true perfection if he doesn't allow himself to fail, admit to those failings, and grow from them. Now, admittedly, uh, the Emperor's Children were a completely different and less demonic legion back when those words were spoken, so it's very likely that Lucius follows a more bastardized version of this. This is compounded on even further, due to the fact that the souls of everyone who has ever managed to beat him are trapped in his armor, and at any given moment, are constantly whispering in his ear, taunting him, mocking him for his past failures, a nonstop barrage of insults and jeers from the dead. The dead, that due to the nature of how they got trapped in his armor in the first place, he can never have a rematch with. This not only pushes Lucius deeper into his madness, but propels him even further on the quest for perfection. This, however, is not just a negative for him, as by absorbing the souls of those who managed to beat him, he also gains insight into all of their memories and experience as well. So every time he fails, he corrects his mistakes and draws upon the wisdom and experience of his victims to gain even more insight into combat. Having done this for over 10,000 years makes him an unbelievably skilled and deadly opponent, regardless of what the memes will have you believe. The combination that we're left with is an absolutely insane individual that cannot die and continues to throw himself into ever more ridiculous and unbeatable scenarios while seeking out even more deadly opponents, often handicapping himself in ever more ridiculous ways. On one hand to challenge himself and push him ever closer to obtaining perfection, well, on the other, just trying to find some form of entertainment. As one commenter on Reddit put it, he's basically a guy who perpetually tries to do the equivalent of a 360 no-scope kill with his sword, because he's essentially unbeatable if he fights seriously. We see echoes of this back during the Horus Heresy, where during the novel Angel Exterminatus, in one of its scenes he finds himself engaged in combat with a horde of Eldari ghost warriors, switching styles between each and every opponent, simply to stave off boredom and not use the same killing move twice. At this point, he's mastered just about every fighting style and weapon combination, and is currently using a barbed whip stolen from a dead man, uh, simply because it's something new and interesting and in the hands of Lucius, an incredibly deadly, albeit unconventional weapon for a space marine. He has an almost savant-like nature when it comes to fighting and is able to pick up and quickly master new styles just by observing them be utilized by other people. Now, earlier in the same book, he manages to perform an immaculate display fighting in the style of the Eldar warriors just by mimicking the poses of a series of their statues and filling in the in-between movements with his own creativity. His fellow Emperor's children are dazzled by the display, and even the Iron Warriors who are accompanying them are begrudgingly impressed as well. If nothing else, to me, all of these factors inherently make him an interesting character. Uh, whether or not he's likable is another story entirely. Now, 40K fans have a number of different traditional arguments they like to engage in, and one of the most popular has always been who or what could actually manage to kill Lucius. These arguments are always fun and a bit ridiculous, but ultimately, we don't really have a concrete answer. We know that in order for him to resurrect inside the body of his killer, the individual has to feel some form of pride in the act of defeating him. On one hand, this is a very fluffy take on the resurrection mechanic and is in line with his patron god Slanesh. It has, however, led to countless debates on the internet. There's a short story known as Pride and Fall that threw a bit of a wrench into these debates and made it a little bit more complicated. It showed Lucius resurrecting in one of the strangest ways possible. You see, the person who ends up killing him and inevitably becomes the next vessel for his resurrection is not some warrior who managed to best him. It's not even somebody present on the battlefield that day. It was, in fact, a humble assembly line worker named Tobias, halfway across the galaxy. For you see, during the swirling melee that Lucius found himself in, he ended up stepping on a landmine, a landmine that Tobias had assembled and taken pride in his work. He had no idea who Lucius was or that his mine had actually killed someone. 
After he resurrects in the goriest way possible by erupting out of Tobias's body, spraying blood all over the other horrified assembly workers, he ends up looking down at the seventh face to have been added to his armor and tells him, hello, I don't know you or how we became acquainted, uh, but that's okay. We have an eternity to get to know one another. He starts running through his mind, trying to figure it out, where exactly he was and how he got here. Once it clicks with him that it had been a landmine that killed him, Lucius is immediately upset. Him, the greatest champion that had ever lived, managed to be killed by a landmine. To put it mildly, this was unbelievably embarrassing to Lucius, and he wondered just how many people he'll have to kill to make sure such information doesn't become widespread. He looks back down at the face, and he's like, do you think this is funny? You derive satisfaction out of this? The only answer he gets is an endless cacophony of Tobias' screams in his head. This short story is incredible, very entertaining and super gory, but it also adds a little bit more depth to Lucius as a character. What's baffling to me is that many Warhammer fans end up pointing to this as the main reason why Lucius is uninteresting, because his resurrection mechanic doesn't seem to make any sense. On one hand, I get that, but I'd bring up a few counterpoints. The first and foremost is that Warhammer 40K, one of the most bombastic and over-the-top universes ever created, is often not too concerned with making sense in the first place. It's full of nine-foot-tall space chads fighting endless waves of aliens and evil space wizards. There's a whole lot of stuff in this franchise that doesn't make any sense, but that's totally okay. It doesn't need to to be endlessly entertaining. I also think there's a bit of nuance that the memes about this event are missing, as the author of the story was attempting to add a bit of depth to his resurrection gimmick, that it may not work exactly like people think it does. The author found himself in an interview for a yet-to-be-released Lucius novel known as The Faultless Blade, and in the interview, he was asked about this short story, and he had this to say. The idea essentially came about from my reading online forums about Lucius, where fans would discuss the sort of loopholes they believed could override his resurrection mechanism, like being killed by artillery or a servitor or the like, something that couldn't take satisfaction from the act of killing him. I love the thread so much that they sparked the idea for the story that became Pride and Fall. Basically, I wanted to demonstrate that Slanesh is maybe a touch craftier than people give him, her, it credit for. After all, if someone takes pride in their work making something, and that something happens to kill Lucius, then that's all that's needed. Even things like Tyranids and Necrons are driven by forces, be it hunger to consume or wrath, that motivate their actions. Fulfilling such a driving force, even on the most minute level, is satisfying, and that opens the door. All that being said, there's some misconceptions about his immortality that I think we should clear up. The first is that he loses all the time. This isn't exactly true, and oftentimes his death was the goal all along. A pretty good example of this comes from the short story in Wolves' Clothing, where Lucius intentionally allows himself to be captured and subsequently killed by a group of space wolves in order to utilize his curse to possess one of their members and infiltrate them. This is a man where death has no consequence, so he uses this to his tactical advantage, a welcoming death in the most over-the-top way imaginable to ultimately further his agendas or, on occasion, just to have a bit of fun. Truly enjoying the act of his own death as much as he relishes inflicting it on others. Due to the nature of his curse being a gift from the God of Excess, there is also a very real possibility that at one point in the future, his patron may grow bored of him and choose to elect a new champion in his place, thus stripping him of his invulnerability. So these ridiculous over-the-top deaths, combined with his 360 no-scope equivalent kills, serve a couple of different purposes. First, bettering himself as a swordsman. Second, relieving some of his boredom. And finally, keeping his god entertained and thus in their favor. I'd also like to point out that in his artwork, a lot of people tend to depict him with a ton of different faces all over his armor. But at the time where the landmine factory worker killed him, he was only the seventh face. Endlessly fighting for 10,000 years and having only been beaten less than 10 times is pretty impressive. So at the end of the day, do I think people on the internet are wrong for not liking Lucius? Absolutely not. He's inherently unlikable. Uh, to make a character like him likable or relatable would be doing them a disservice. But do I personally think he's a good character? Absolutely. I think he's a remarkable character. And every time he shows up in one of the books I'm reading, I do find myself getting excited. I think he's the victim of memes becoming the baseline of knowledge about the character for a lot of people, which is something that is pretty common in 40K. This might not always be a bad thing, though, if it gets people interested in something. I know I've definitely messed up in the past where I tried to make a video about the orcs, for example, 
where to me, the joke was incredibly obvious, that these were all memes and they weren't necessarily true, considering the asterisks all over true and facts. And the second to last orc fact being that there are so many made up stories about the orcs that it's incredibly difficult to tell what's true and what isn't. And then the final fact being the time that a bunch of orcs Voltron themselves into a tank. Like I said, I thought the joke was obvious, but those videos ended up being a lot more popular than I could have anticipated, considering that at the time I was a pretty small channel. To this day, I still have mixed feelings on this, because these videos were a lot of people's introduction to 40k, and they entered the fandom believing that memes were actual lore. But at the same time, those videos ended up resonating with a lot of people, who would subsequently go on to pick up their very first Warhammer book and join our wonderful community. Now, from my perspective, I do find that to be a net positive, and I'll gladly take on the barrage of comments from people who also miss the joke saying, I get all my lore from memes and I don't know what I'm talking about, blah, blah, blah. If it means I was able to introduce someone to something that they genuinely enjoy, then I'm happy I made those videos. What's unfortunate though is when memes like this have the opposite effect. Much like how with Lucius, the memes don't really capture the character's nuance and inevitably paint a very negative perception of them. This makes people ignore them and do themselves a disservice by refusing to pick up a book about a character that they would probably end up liking. But at the end of the day, you're gonna have to make your own judgment call. If you still don't like Lucius, I think that's valid. But I would encourage people who tend to like the villains more than the heroes in the story to give this guy another chance. But what do you guys think? Is Lucius actually a good character or is he incredibly poorly written? If you don't like him, what are some things that you would change to make him a better character? Who's another character in 40K that you think gets a bad rap? Is there a character that you think is tragically underrated? Or what about somebody that everybody else seems to like, but you just can't get into? I look forward to reading all of your comments down below. I know I say this all the time, but thanks again to everybody who watches my videos all the way through. The watch time helps this channel out considerably and it really means the world to me. And if you haven't already, go ahead and take a second to subscribe to the channel and like this video. It only takes a second and it helps me out a lot. Thanks again to all of my patrons that support the work that I do. And with all of that out of the way, I'll catch y'all in the next one.